Great to see you again, Jim. I yeah, talked to you just a month ago to ask yeah. you if you would do this interview with me, or not really interview, the Austrian Stammtisch. Yeah. Uh, and I explained to you what Stammtisch really means, that it means that it is for the locals that go to a restaurant and uh, sit down and have something to eat uh, without a reservation or anything like this. And this is a table that's only really allowed for locals. And okay. I have a picture here uh, that you can see. This is kind of like a typical Austrian stumptisch. Yeah. Do we have to wear the lederhosen? No, but I mean, you know, I if we, if we do the Austrian stumptisch, then of course we have the Austrian hat on. You know, uh, I gotta... ready for anything like that. Or but if you want to do the American right. stumptisch, then we go, of course, and uh, put the, the cowboy hat on. So we are ready yeah. for any stumptisch that you want to do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get one of those uh, Jaeger hats. Oh, yeah, right. they're, they're yeah. really great and they, they, they help you in the rain or in the sun or whatever. I mean, it's just like a cowboy hat, but the Austrian version. Right. But anyway, the, the, what I wanted to ask you is, is you know, this is like a, just a casual conversation. And I wanted to first of all find out how is Avatar coming along since you're in the middle of shooting and I'm right <laughs> now interrupting you. This is your lunch break uh, in New it's Zealand. All good. It's all good. It's all good. Um, actually, we're editing now and I'm I'm still doing virtual cameras, which, you know, where I I operate the camera, but I'm done with all the actors. All the actors have gone home. They have to go find another job now. Uh, so we're done with the live action shooting. We're done with the capture. And you came to the stage a few times and saw us doing the capture work, you know, with all the uh, yeah. marker dots and all that. That's yeah. right. As a matter of fact, I remember it was back in 2017 when I went the first time down to yeah. the studio, studio here in Los Angeles, south of Los Angeles. And you were just doing the uh, preparation work and some uh, kind of sh filming and, and stuff and trying out the various different stunts and all that stuff. So you've been working on this now for three years. years. Yeah, about three and a half years to date. So we've got everything in the can for movie two, movie three, and part of movie four. And now we're in this long post process. Um, and, yeah. and how long is it? Are you, are you pretty much free? I know that you were held up. Because of the coronavirus, even though yeah, New Zealand, yeah. which is the number one country in the world, the way they really protected the people the right way. We're so lucky that we based our production here years ago. In fact, we did the first Avatar here. And, uh, you know, I have a farm here. I live here part time. So we had this place to retreat back to to be able to continue working. Mm -hmm. uh, so we just got we just got lucky. You know, and, and I'm certainly sympathetic to all the trials and tribulations that other, the other folks in Hollywood and the film uh, industry in general have been going through. I'm particularly sympathetic for the theater owners who've had nothing to show for a year. Right. You know, what a nightmare this, this is for them. And, of, of course, a few of them are failing now, including the Arclight Cinema, which is one of my favorites, which is a, yeah. really a tragedy. Did you pick New Zealand because it was environmentally a great place to go? Uh, or, or why did you pick New Zealand to shoot the film? I personally love New Zealand and one of the top uh, visual effects facilities in the world. I would argue the best is here, right here in Wellington, which is uh, Weta Digital. Um, they're the ones that did the Planet of the Apes films. They did the first Avatar. So they're the ones that create the most sort of reality in their facial animation. They also did Alita Battle Angel. So it was really more about working with them and using uh, Peter Jackson's sound stages and everything. He'd built it all out right, here. Right. Now, we, we're using this year uh, the Austin World Summit on Environment. We're using the whole theme of healthy planet, healthy uh, yeah. people, as you know. And uh, so I just want to hear what your take is on that relationship between the environment uh, and, you know, the world environment and the, the health of the people. Well, look, I think that they're absolutely linked. They're very closely coupled. We're not healthy right now as a civilization. We're not, our planet's not, you know, we use the term planet, but of course the, the, the rocky planet itself is going to survive for billions of years. It's the, it's that thin biosphere on the outside of the, of the planet that, that we're devastating so rapidly. And, you know, I mean, if you think about climate change as a fever, 
we've got a fever right now. We have to cure it. It's about to spike over the next few decades and become life-threatening, I think, not only to our biosphere, but to, to our civilization. And we have to take action. But yeah, healthy, healthy planet, healthy humans. And I know you mean sort of more from a pollution standpoint. I'm speaking kind of more broadly, metaphorically. We're not healthy, right? We're not healthy right now. We're not eating healthy. We're not breathing healthy. Um, we're devastating our, our uh, biodiversity and all of our wildlife. And so psychologically, spiritually, we're not healthy because we've become uncoupled right. from nature. Right. You know, indigenous vegan... people don't, indigenous people don't even have a word for nature. How is your vegan don't... thing going? Oh, you, vegan, you vegan know, thing's vegan great. No meat and all that. I haven't eaten a molecule of, of animal anything, not the glandular secretions, uh, oh, dairy, I mean, not the meat for, uh, for nine years. Right, so, right, I know, you know, I know. Well, you look very healthy. It obviously works 100%. Dude, and I'm healthy. On that. I don't get sick either. Yeah. Yeah, you don't not gain weight. Healthy. You don't get diabetes. You know, you don't, you don't get sick. Now, the last time... Uh, we talked, which was for the Austin uh, Summit, which was last September. We did an interview for that. And uh, you, you, this was kind of like just shortly before the elections. Yeah. And, um, we all know that the reason why we haven't really moved forward is because there's still a lot of politicians there that, that, that deny us of climate change and uh, or they don't have really the balls to move forward and to do something that is really yeah. the best thing for the people. They are yeah. worried about what their party says, all this kind of stuff. And you yeah. said to me, you says, well, let's vote the assholes out. I remember yeah. that quote. That yeah. was a great quote. <laughs> and so the question really is, were we successful? Well, I think we were, you know, we were successful in getting the assholes out to the extent that we now have a president that understands that climate change is a real thing and really is willing to do something about it. You know, there's such a slim margin, obviously, in the House and the Senate, especially in the Senate, that it remains to be seen if we can actually get anything done and make any progress, because we need to be taking big strides. And obviously, the Biden administration is proposing, you know, a pretty ambitious uh, campaign to deal with climate change and green infrastructure, which is something that you've always promoted, right. you know, green energy, green jobs, green infrastructure, all that sort of thing. So this is ambitious. It's the right type of move. Remains to be seen whether the curmudgeons that remain in right. government right. will successfully oppose it. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, uh, I think that we have seen already some positive changes because, as you know, this is only something that can work I mean, the whole world works together. And I feel like for the very fact that we have now again joined, uh, you know, that we are going to be part of COP26 again. And yeah, yeah. Internationally, we joined the international community. Just that alone, I think, is very helpful. And we yes. will see now where this goes. I still think that there is a problem with the communication because I think the more often they call, you know, that uh, President Biden has a climate conference, climate conference, climate. I still think that the majority of people, when you poll, the name climate, they don't know what the hell that means. And I still think that we should talk about, you know, fighting pollution and all those things. I mean, what is your take on this whole thing? We have talked about that before, because it seems to me that no matter if you promote a movie uh, or if you promote your art uh, or, uh, you know, uh, some or, uh, some policy issues or whatever it is, businesses or whatever it is, you have to communicate the right way. And I just think that uh, there is a, such a drop in numbers when you say climate, when you ask people, you think climate, uh, uh, you know, issues are important issues today, or you know, then when you say pollution, and say, oh yeah, that's very important. You got to get rid of pollution. So, uh, what is your take on that? I'm going to support your position from a marketing perspective and push back a little bit in in the in the the big picture. I think that pollution is a fair way to characterize it because basically it's carbon pollution. So pollution is any waste product that we generate that we stick out into the environment that has a negative effect, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. definitely carbon. And it's good to remind people that it's carbon pollution because it, all, it has the effect of raising the global temperature and creating this kind of violent revved up uh, global climate that creates cold areas and hot areas and famines and changes ocean currents and does all these horrible things. But it's also that carbon is going straight into the ocean and causing ocean acidification, 
which is not climate change. So it's fair to go back to the cause and call it pollution. I think that that's fair. I think the reason that climate doesn't impact people is because they don't really understand the jeopardy they're, they're in. You can die from air pollution. The way you die from climate or from carbon pollution is not direct, it's indirect. So you have crop failures, you have famine, you have refugees and immigrants on the move because their farms have dried up and the soil has blown away. And people don't really understand we are already in a world that's being impacted negatively by climate change a lot. And let let me give you a a great example. So a million farmers, there was a, a drought in Syria a few years ago that was unprecedented. It was clearly caused by climate change. Million farmers migrated to the city saying to the government, help us. The government shit all over them. And they went on the road. They started going to Greece and trying to get across the Mediterranean, flooding into Europe. And that caused a pushback on immigration policy that brought into power a number of populist leaders, right? So this whole tip over, this whole Brexit thing, this whole tip over toward populism and hyper-nationalism and all that, that, that you know, we experience in the United States as well with, with, uh, with Trump and, and with the, you know, everything that's been going on the last four years was one of the things that fed into it was climate. Same thing with, remember the thousands of Guatemalans that were coming up and challenging the border and it got Trump's base all revved up and all that stuff. We're seeing direct political fallout of climate change now. We're seeing it now because those Guatemalans were forced off their land that they had farmed for four, five, six generations because of drought, because of something that had never happened in the histories of their families. It's new stuff, right? So immigration, famine, wars, crashing economies, failed states, all of the things that create misery and uncertainty and insecurity um, are, are going to double and triple and so on over the years. You don't die from climate change, you die from all its other effects, the effects that it has on people. You know, I know. That's why I said to be able to communicate that, you know, how dangerous pollution CO2 is. Yes. If we stop that and if we go and And methane, alternative kind of energies and stuff like that and and cars, alternative fueled cars and all this, I think this is the direction to go. So I totally agree with you, which actually reminds me on the quote that you had that people have to wake wake the fuck up. You said in one of the interviews. Yes, they do. Because you're going in the wrong direction in the fastest possible way. Yeah. You can get it to Thelma and Louise. Uh, like <laughs> yeah. I remember you said, they heading for the for the cliff. Yeah. And they're going 90 miles an hour. The top is down. The radio is clearing and everything like this. And they're going to go towards the, towards the cliff. And so the question really is, do you see that we have, since the last time we talked, have we at all slowed down going for that cliff? Look, I think there are people of good conscience everywhere you know, such as yourself and all of our colleagues in the, in the environmental community that understand the problem. It's getting, it's prying the hands of the money interests and the, and the corporate interests that benefit from a status quo. Sure, it's a short-term benefit. They'll continue to make money for as many quarters as they can right up until the wheels come off or we go off that cliff. We got to get their hands pried off the levers of power. And part of that is it's a political fight. Part of it is we just have to do things ourselves as the people from the grassroots, from the bottom up, just like Black Lives Matter. We got to do that for the for the environment as well. And you know where I'm going to go next with this, which is we don't have a lot of control as individuals of how we generate power. The utilities do and government programs and subsidies and all that. But what we can control is the amount of meat and dairy that we consume, which has a huge, huge carbon impact. We can change, we can change that ourselves right now. It's a hack. It's not tech. It's not tech coming over the horizon to save us. It's us saving ourselves. You know? Well, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. But I mean, I think that um, solar, as you know, really is fantastic not only because it creates clean energy uh but also it makes you independent of those utilities yes exactly the utilities you know they they they're they very powerful and they yeah. have big lobbying groups and they get a lot of times their way 
so the more I think people concentrate on putting solar on their roof, the more independent they are actually uh, from those utilities. Yeah, it's highly distributed power generation, and it's being generated right where it's being used. So you're not going to have the the line losses, right? You're not going to have these big transmission line infrastructures. You're not dependent on it. You know, you look at Los Angeles. You fly over Los Angeles when you're when you're coming into LAX, and you see mile after mile of these big roofs that are acres across, and they're just baking in the sun. I mean, we could have so many megawatts of power generated right locally in Los Angeles. And that's just that's just an example. So I know you were a pioneer, you were a leader in home solar, highly distributed power generation. I think it's I think it's one of the great hacks that we have available to us. But right. again, the utilities lobby against it. And yeah. the governments are slow to encourage it. And, and sometimes they'll create a subsidy and then they'll take it away and then they'll create it again. Right. There's no consistency and certainly no federal program promoting it. Uh, do you, let me ask you, I mean, environmentalists, a lot of times talk about doom and gloom and all this kind of stuff. Are there any technological kind of advantages or, or uh, uh, advancements that are being made uh, that you have seen lately? If it is kind of electric cars or some kind of energy storage or whatever it may be, technological or sucking the CO2 out of the air, whatever it may be. Is there anything that you have come across that is promising to you that is optimistic rather than always just talking about the, that the world coming to an end? Well, the world is coming to an end and we need to face that, but we can prevent it. We can prevent it, but you don't, you know, if the house is on fire, you don't just sort of whisper to somebody, hey, you know, in the hypothetical uh, case where the house was burning, what would you do about it? You say, run, that's where we are. And that's what we need to do. In terms of, of, of technical solutions, I think there's a real danger from people becoming techno optimists and, oh, Silicon Valley is going to save us. Or those smart engineers at MIT are going to save us. Look, steady progress is happening every day. Holy shit, look at that. That is a tankard. What do you call that? It's a beer mug. It's part of the Stammtisch. Yeah. So what kind of beer are you drinking? I'm thinking, it's, um, well, I don't want to do a promotion here for beer. But, <laughs> but it's, it's a good Austrian lager. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, good. <laughs> anyway, what I was saying is that there's a danger with assuming that tech is going to rush in and save us. And everybody, people, people are working on like, we want to build a machine. Somebody was bragging to me a, a, a couple months ago. We've designed a machine. It's the size of a shipping container. It only costs about $4 million per unit. And it actually draws carbon out of the air. And I said, oh, and Elon Musk has put up a big prize to create such a device, right? I said, I've got one too. It doesn't cost anything at all. It's been proven at scale for millions of years. And it works very, very well. It's called a tree. So the second we stop cutting down all the trees in the world as fast as humanly possible, which is what we're doing, kind of mowing the Amazon as quickly as we can, then I'm going to listen to these stupid arguments about million dollar devices for, for sequestering carbon. Doesn't make sense. We need to trust the natural processes a lot more. You're absolutely correct. Now, something that is more current, I want to just ask you that before we finish here, is about Kubushima. Uh, Fukushima, yeah, yeah. you say. Fukushima, yeah. it, it was in 2011, I think it was uh, this disaster there. Uh, and and uh, now, uh, since you are an ocean explorer and you yeah. in, uh, you know, down to the Titanic and uh, 12,600 feet or whatever it was, which yeah. is kind of 2.3 miles for people that don't know how deep that is, how far this is. Yeah. But you, 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 you're very passionate about the oceans also, besides right. the air and all this kind of stuff. What do you think about them now talking about releasing uh, the nuclear waste, even though they say that they've taken the, 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 the thing, the, the toxic stuff out and, and denuclearized it or whatever it's, uh, you call it. Uh, but, you know, the neighboring countries, uh, Alarm, China, the South Korea and all those countries are going crazy. What is your take on all this? Look, I approach everything from a standpoint of science and data. And I'm not fully briefed on this. The, the Japanese know they're going to be under scrutiny with this. So my guess is they've, they've filtered most of the dangerous radionuclides out. But I don't know that. I haven't seen. And obviously, there should be independent scrutiny and monitoring 
of the radiation levels in what they're talking about releasing. I believe they've left the tritium in, but you have to remember that tritium is in seawater. It's it's basically a, a, a heavy form of, of right. water like like deuterium. So it's it's always out there in seawater anyway in microscopic amounts. So the question is, you know, somebody independent needs to look at this. And I, it looks to me like it's getting politicized. Like, you know, China's going to use it as a way to bash yeah, Japan sure. because China is such a polluter itself. And, and they're always looking to point fingers at us or at, at other countries. So it sounds like something that becomes a political hot football. And it's only going to get resolved by having somebody go in with a, essentially a Geiger counter and read the, read the rates of what they're right, about right. to, what they plan on releasing. And if people aren't happy, they shouldn't release it. It's pretty yeah. much that simple. And I just wanted to ask it because it's such a, it's, you read it in the papers now and hear it on the news all the time. So I thought that I wanted to hear your take on it because yeah. you're so passionate yeah. about the ocean and, and, and stuff like that. Okay, last question. Just, I mean, I remember the last time uh, when you came out with Avatar. Yeah. Uh, Fox Studio had you kind of like, uh, uh, you know, say, can you take some of this tree hugging things out? Yeah, yeah. You know, and, stuff? and you said no, and of course uh, you were right. It right. wasn't part of the movie at all, and you made two point eight billion dollars, and it made it the highest grossing movie in the history. So, um, do you think there's any danger that anyone is going to come to you now with the with, with your new movie? And uh, and what is your take in general about this kind of like indirect messages? in a movie because it was really a wonderful message, but he didn't kind of talk about the environment. No, exactly. It was part of it. Yeah. Part of the story yeah. And you got it, you know, so I really loved it. So what is your take of that? I think that there's a way to make a film about these important themes. Uh, Avatar was a little bit of a Trojan horse. It promised all this spectacle and this beauty and this adventure. Um, and it delivered, obviously, on that. And people went back and saw it over and over. So it's not like they got in and went, oh, shit, this is just an environmental film. I'm out of here. You know, they still enjoyed the movie. And they were able to think about a little bit our relationship with nature, our relationship with each other. Where have we sort of gone off track? And that's what science fiction does. Science fiction kind of holds up a mirror to who we are. But it's, a, it's like a warped mirror. You go to another planet to look back. We've got beautiful rainforests right here, but we had to go to Pandora to appreciate a rainforest. The, the, the question that I can't answer is how many people make the link in their minds that we're really talking about Earth and really challenging people to step up and do something for our biodiversity, our indigenous cultures, our rainforests here on Earth. I think there are probably out of those millions and millions of Avatar fans, there were probably a small group of people that actually took it to heart and maybe signed up for Greenpeace or maybe became activists or maybe did something about it. So, you know, but I don't think, like you said, you're not going to get people in the, in the theaters if you're just banging them over the head with a message, especially a gloom and doom message. Well, well anyway, uh, the bottom line is that I cannot wait for the movie to come out. I know it's coming out in December of 2022. Correct. Uh, because of the delays of the coronavirus. And yeah, the, right, the right. Lack of theaters that are open now, uh, open now and all of those kind of things. Uh, uh, just this last question, I think I have to ask that. Is there anything, any scoop about Avatar that we didn't know? Or that we okay, don't? all right. Here, let me just run a couple scenes for you right now because I happen to have it right here at my Avid. Oops. Just kidding. <laughs> I love that. Man, you set me up on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you ran, you know, you, you've, you've dealt with top levels of government. You know how security and intelligence works. If you don't, if you want to keep a secret, don't tell anybody. Right, right. I just didn't want to leave here and to just have someone say, why the hell didn't he ask his buddy for some inside <laughs> scoop or something like that? Okay, All but right, anyway. Well, I, I'm, I'm guessing that it, that this is this stomptish is not going to just be seen by the two of us. So maybe sometime when we're having a uh, a glass of schnapps together, I'll give you the inside scoop. I know that. Thank you very much, Jim, <laughs> for for your time. I know we had lunch break. Good luck with all your work. Okay, and I uh, cannot wait to see the film. Okay, I cannot wait to see right. you again to go on a motorcycle ride. Yeah, and to have fun again with you. Okay, absolutely. We got to right. get past this damn pandemic first. All right, buddy. Thank Great to see much. you. Thank you, my okay. friend. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.